Connor Speeder here at the Museum of Science. My name is Eric, my pronouns are he, him. I'm an educator at the Museum of Science and you are here for our Science of Light, very special show. Before we get started, just a couple of announcements. Please make sure you stay in your pod where you are seated and with your group because of the protocols we have in our theater. If you need to leave at any reason, for any reason that's during the show, you can go to the door that is in this corner that you came in through. If you have any noise making or light making devices, especially a cell phone or those awesome flashlights that you all have in your goodie bags, please keep them off during our show. I promise I'll give you a chance at the very end to join in and shine your flashlights when I ask for them. But since we're doing ex the exploring the science of light, it's gonna be important to make the theater dark a whole lot of time. So we'll be turning the lights down to explore light and some experiments together. We wanna make sure it's as dark as we can. So keep those flashlights away until the very end when I'll invite you to turn them back on and join us. So what we'll do today is talk a little bit about the science of light. We'll explore some experiments that you can do at home. We'll look at what light is and we'll think about some of the little mysteries that you might have seen around your house and always wondered about that have to do with light. And we'll talk about how we can use our understanding of light to engineer solutions to real world problems, both small and big. And at the end of our show, we will have a glow in the dark finale spectacular, which is when I'll invite you to turn on your lights and join us in our celebration of light. So let's get started with our show. Our first mystery has to do with going to the grocery store and seeing bottles of milk. This bottle of hood milk comes in a white plastic container. And that is pretty unique. Most food and beverages come in plastic that's clear. So if you buy a package of strawberries or raspberries, if you buy a bottle of juice, that uh, plastic is see-through and this white plastic is a little bit different. So why is that? Well, our first question is, does light actually get through this plastic or not? It looks like it doesn't, but sometimes just looking at something isn't really that good. So what we're going to do is do an experiment to test how good this hood bottle is at blocking light. And what we'll use here, what you can use at home to try this out is just a piece of black construction paper. If you've ever had construction paper that's darker in color, like black or purple, if it lays out in the sun, say you do an arts and crafts project and it's out in the light for an extended period of time, you can see how it fades from dark black all the way to light black. And that's because the light is actually changing the paper. So you can use our light block bottle, you can cut out a piece of it you can put it on a piece of construction paper and test its light blocking ability by leaving it out in the sun for a couple hours. And you can add a lot of other materials from around your house. You can try transparent things that light some light through, like parchment paper. You can try fabrics. You can try other food and beverage containers. You can put all those on a piece of paper along with maybe a pair of sunglasses, leave it out in the sun for a little bit, a couple hours, and you'll be able to see what actually blocks light and what doesn't. Now I can't do this experiment here in the theater because I don't have three hours and I don't have the sun. But what I do have is a bit of special paper that reacts a little bit more fast than construction paper does. And I have a much more powerful light here than the regular lights in our theater to simulate the light of our sun. So what we need to do is just let that, let the light fall on that for another minute and then we'll activate the experiment with a little bit of water and we'll be able to test out whether this piece of our white hood bottle was able to block light. So we can take it and we can kind of spray some water on it. And anywhere that's white on this paper means that the light was completely blocked. Anywhere that's blue means that that light was able to pass through. So our clear plastic in front of it, we'll be able to see it let all that light through, but you can see the impression of where that bottle was. So that bottle is really good at blocking light. It's engineered to actually block most of the light and prevent it from getting into the milk. You can try this experiment at home with all those different materials. That still really doesn't answer the question of why. Why would you engineer a bottle of milk to stop the light from getting through? So to understand that, we need to do a whole lot more experiments. We need to talk about the chemistry of light, the physics of light, and the energy of light. It turns out light comes in lots and lots of different energies. Energy, very high energy light is emitted by exploding stars. Very low energy light we use to get a signal on our cell phone. That kind of light can travel through solid objects, which is why you get cell phone reception inside. It can pick up a light signal coming from a satellite traveling right through the walls of our building. 
And the light that we see with our eyes is just one very narrow band of energy, kind of right in the middle of that energy scale, not too energetic and not too weak, visible light. It happens to be the light that's given off the most by our sun, and our eyes are extremely well adapted at picking it up. Now our eyes have evolved to be able to see lots and lots of different colors. And I have three colored light bulbs here that correspond to the three kinds of cells in our eyes that sense color. We have cells that sense red light, we have some that sense blue, and some that sense green. And the way we get all the millions of different colors that you can see is having different amounts of these lights mixed together. And we'll show that by darkening our theater and trying to see what happens when we block some of this light. So, and, and a very important part of science is making predictions. So we have our three light bulbs here, and we're going to make a shadow of these light bulbs up on our board. And before we do that, I want you all to make a prediction about what those shadows will look like, what size they'll be, what color they'll be. Go ahead and turn to the people in your group next to you and make a prediction. What do you think we'll see when we put something in front of these lights and start to make some shadows? Will it be fairly normal? Will it be different colors? Will we get red, green, and blue shadows? Make a prediction, and then we'll test it out. OK, I hear some good predictions out there. Let's try it. So I'll hold up an object and block some of that light. And our shadows, who thought that we'd get a pink, yellow, and really bright blue shadow? Anybody? So this is one of the ways light works. And not just light, but our eyes and how we perceive it. Each one of these circles is our object blocking just one of these light bulbs and not the other two. So the one in the middle, yellow, is blocking the blue light and only letting the red and the yellow light through. So red and yellow light mixed together, our eyes perceive as yellow. I can prove that by turning off our blue light, and now our whole board turns yellow. So we can get the color yellow using red and green lights. We can get the colors cyan, yellow, and magenta by using red, green, and blue. And if we block two at a time, then we start to get that red and the green as well. Now this is a really cool set of experiments. We could spend the entire show just with these three lights and looking at how they can combine together. But I'll leave most of that experimentation up to you. You can go visit our lighthouse exhibit across the way. You can bring our lights back up now. And you can try it out at home if you have maybe some lights at home that are in your holiday stash of different colors. You can see how they mix together and what kind of cool shadows you can make, all because of the way our eyes perceive those different energies as different colors. OK, so the next mystery that I have for you is another one that I've wondered while I'm sitting on the couch and watching TV. What's wrong with the little light on the front of my remote control? Every remote control for every TV that I've ever owned my whole life has a little light bulb that I've never seen light up. So why are they broken, and why does it still actually work? Well, it turns out that light is invisible to us, but it still exists. So my friends in the front row, can you see any light coming off of that light bulb? We can't see this light, but if I point it right into the camera, that light is there. This is called infrared light. It's not visible, so we can't pick it up with our eyes, but it is just lower energy than we can see. And that means that other instruments, like our camera, can pick up that light, and instruments like our TV and our projectors and our cameras can use that invisible light to pass signals back and forth. So we can engineer a solution to how do we send a light signal across a room in an otherwise brightly lit room. We can use a different energy of light that we can't see with our eyes, but we can see with equipment. And we can engineer solutions to lots of problems with that too. Infrared light and infrared cameras can be used to pick up body heat. So we can do things like track wildlife, endangered wildlife, wildlife like a rhinoceros. We can track where they are at night using infrared cameras. And we can prevent poaching because we have a better idea of where they are and how to protect those rhinos. OK, so the next thing that I want to talk about is light of a different energy. Not just uh, below what we can see, but just above it. Ultraviolet light is an invisible kind of light that has more energy than what we can see. You might be familiar with that as a black light. If you've ever seen things glow in a black light, that's a very specific thing that we'll talk about because light can affect the physical properties of objects. So I'll show you an example of that. If we turn our lights down, I have socks that light up. So that 
thread that's making up the dinosaurs in my socks is absorbing that really high energy light and giving off light that we can see that is blue or purple. The same is true of this object we have right here. We have an ordinary looking rock. We can make the color green by shining our ultraviolet light on it. So I'm not giving any green light. Again, friends, if you have those flashlights, please keep them off during our show. We don't shine any green light on this rock, but the minerals in this rock can absorb that really high energy light and give it back off as green light, lower energy light. Now, animals can use this to communicate with each other, to drive away predators, to attract prey, especially deep in the ocean, where not a lot of low energy light makes it, but only higher energy light. So if you have a shell as a turtle that can give off green light when blue light hits it, you are the only, blue th you are the only green thing in your part of the ocean, and you can look pretty unique or scary or um, unappetizing. Now, we can use this in a couple different ways. You can turn our lights back up. One of the engineering solutions we can have with this is just something as simple as invisible ink. Now, that's something that's really cool because I can show you this part, uh, I can show you this canvas that I've written an invisible message on. Looks like absolutely nothing, right? Looks like you can't see anything, even our friends in the front row, not able to see anything at all. So I'll go ahead and put it on our stand. We'll turn our lights back down and we'll see if we can see our invisible message. It's actually upside down because I couldn't even see it either. Museum of Science, our invisible message is there and there's a lot of different ways that you can use household materials, even ones like tonic water and lemon juice to make an invisible message that's completely invisible to your eye until the right energy light hits it and it re-emits that light as a lower energy light that you can see. Now, this has some applications with things like, um, with things like invisible ink, but also with things like counterfeiting. So before we get our lights back up, I have one more thing to show you, and that is a $20 bill which has this really bright stripe on it. That invisible ink there isn't used for fun, it is used for anti-counterfeiting. So we can actually make sure that the $20 bill is real by shining this higher energy light on it. If that stripe isn't there, then that means that the proper ink wasn't used and it might be a fake $20 bill. Okay, so that's a little bit about how light can affect materials. But light can come from a lot of different sources. Most of our light that we've produced so far today comes from electricity. We've either plugged some things in or used batteries. But it turns out that light can come from objects being able to absorb and emit other kinds of light. But light can also come from chemical reactions. There's a lot going on when one substance meets another and they can react and produce heat. They can produce incredible amounts of energy. They can also produce light. And the most familiar example I can give you of that is something like a glow stick. Who's used a glow stick before? These are pretty common and again, pretty fun way to experiment with light. You just crack one of these open and you shake it. It starts to give off light and you can find your friends when you go to, your, to the fireworks down at the beach. All of you have a blue glow stick. And you can see each other even in the dark. You can hit the lights again, Leslie. It turns out that the way these glow sticks work is by having two different chemicals inside of them. Those chemicals are separated by a little glass vial. One of them inside the plastic tube is inside of that. And when you bend it, you're actually breaking that glass and mixing the chemicals together. And when they mix together, the reaction doesn't give off any heat, but it does give off light. And we can engineer that and fine tune it to give off only certain kinds of light. So orange or green, it's a pretty fun way to create light, but it also can be, again, used as an engineering solution to a problem. Say you have an emergency rescue or you have a ready to go bag for something like earthquake preparedness, you can put some really powerful glow sticks in there. It's a really easy way to generate light without any heat, without any worry of batteries. And it's going to be, able to, it's going to be something you can just put down and it can light up a whole really dark area. So we can use this engineering solution to create light with chemistry. Now the opposite of this, if you want to turn our lights up again, Leslie, is using chemistry, uh, using light to create chemistry. So light can drive chemical reactions. And the most common example I can give you of that is what happens to me whenever I go to the beach on a sunny day and I lay out in the sun and read a book for too long, what's going to happen to me? 
I'm going to get a sunburn, right? If I don't put on my sunblock, my skin is going to undergo a chemical reaction. It will take a couple of hours, but it will turn red, it will blister, it will start to itch and be painful. It's actually a chemical reaction in the skin cells of your hand or arm or whatever is exposed that's driven by light. So light can cause chemical reactions. Now we have an engineering solution to that, which is sunblock. So I have one panel here that's covered in sunblock and one that is not covered in sunblock that we will use as our model of skin. And to model the cells inside of our skin, I have two different jars here that will light up when high energy light falls on it. So if we turn down our lights again, we'll see that I can shine my light on the one without any of that sunblock, and we start to get that glow in the dark. On the one that has the sunblock, nothing is really happening. So we can block that light. Even though visible light goes through, we can see right through it to that jar, the higher energy light that is actually causing the chemical reactions in our skin gets blocked. So sunblock is a really great way to stop that chemical reaction from happening. Now what, this, uh, what these beads are doing is glowing in the dark. That's different from the, what we saw earlier with the rock and with the uh, ink that needs to have an actual light source on it. If I go over to the side of the stage here, glow in the dark is actually phosphorescence, which is something different. This is when the light is re-emitted over a much longer time period, seconds or even minutes. So we can have some really cool effects by having all of that light on here. If I hit it with really high energy light but block some of it, then we can freeze our shadows in place. So that is a glow in the dark effect that is entirely different chemically than what we saw with things like fluorescence. That is light that is emitted instantly. Okay, you can turn our lights back up, Leslie. So this brings us really all the way back to the beginning of our show and our first question, which was, why does this bottle of hood milk come in this white plastic? Well, it turns out that it's to stop these chemical reactions that we just talked about. Light can cause chemical reactions, and sometimes we don't want those chemical reactions to happen. In the case of milk, light from the grocery store, light that's natural and outside, while milk is in transit or while it's on the shelf, even for a sh short time, it can affect the chemistry of that milk. It can cause chemical reactions that alter milk's taste. And studies have shown that after just a couple hours of exposure, that amount of chemical reaction can change the taste noticeably. So we can tell that the milk doesn't taste as fresh if too much light has hit it. That's why this light block bottle was engineered. It's a solution to a problem of keeping our milk fresh while light is hitting it, not letting that light hit the milk and stopping it at the bottle is not an aesthetic choice, it's science. Okay, so we've reached the very end of our show. We've talked all about the science of light. We've so shown a lot of cool experiments that you can try at home. And the very last thing that we're going to do is have a grand finale where I finally am going to invite you to turn on those flashlights and join along with us. We're gonna put on some music, we're going to open our curtains, and we are going to have a glow-in-the-dark extravaganza finale. So, if my friends could join me out here on the stage, we will get started, turn down our lights, feel free to dance along with us as we have our grand finale. So we have lots of bubbles that are glowing in the dark. They're fluorescing with some of this light. We have glow sticks. We're using chemistry to create some light. And we'll add in one more glow in the dark secret message for all of you as we finish our show. We want to thank everyone for coming and participating with those flashlights. Hopefully you learned a little bit of something about how light works and you'll be inspired to try some of these experiments on your own. You can find them on our website and on Hood Milk's website. But that is the end of our show. So in just a minute, we'll put the lights back up. And we want to thank you for coming to the Science of Light today. Have a fantastic rest of your day at the Museum of Science.
Thank you.